Hello, Mates Right Nation. I've got my first Olympic gold champion on the show today. It's a record for me after 149 episodes that I've recorded and top 1% of all podcasts worldwide. It's going to be an absolute privilege. We're going to be talking about performance and recovery. It was one of the best divers the world's ever seen. So I want you to really listen closely because I've got Laura Wilkinson on the Mate to Thrive show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. Brilliant. Now, there's so many awards and achievements, World Cup champion, World Championship gold. I mean, there's golds all over the place, years and years on the U.S. diving team. It's, it's an incredible achievement. So I'm going to ask this first question before we get into stories and, and testimonies. But what has been your greatest highlight or achievement in your diving career? Oh, that's a hard one. Um you know, as, as amazing as, uh, an Olympic gold medal is, um, actually just making the team that first year was probably a bigger highlight for me because of what I went through to get there. Um, breaking my foot in three places and only having really like two and a half weeks to train before that event. So it completely changed me, uh, inside and out and showed me that anything's possible. Brilliant. And when I think of you and just your story and speaking to our friend, John Doolittle, I think of anti-fragile, someone who went through some real hardships and actually got stronger out of them. So we'll go and dive deeper into that. But I want people to sort of the audience and the viewers on YouTube to grab onto two stories that you helped your athletes or your coaches regarding mindset, because we want to go deep into mindset, possibly talk about flow. Laura, if you're comfortable with that, I want to talk about biohacking and peptides and infrared sauna and cold thermogenesis and lymphatic drainage, all the things that you probably know well about because of all your performance history and that. But give us two stories where mindset was the key that unlocked people's potential. Well, um, I had an athlete a couple of years ago, I had just started kind of coaching and mentoring some other athletes and she was actually a master's diver. So she wa wasn't on like the senior circuit. She was a little bit older um, and doing it in like the age group level, which was awesome. And she was still diving platform, um, but she was having a lot of fear and some trouble with that. And I took her through some really simple practices and really just showed her that like, it's a process. You can't just say, I'm not scared. Like you have to face your fear um, and how to handle that, how to face it and move forward past it. And she even got to the point where she would take her exercises onto the pool deck and in between dives during the competition was writing down, you know, different oh. thoughts to help actively change her mindset. Um, and she's like, it worked. It helped her so much. She ended up winning a world master's title that year. It was wow. really cool to watch that that process. And, and just this last few weeks, um, I've opened up my course again and I had a girl as young as 10 years old, um, taking my course. And it was really cool because she's had some, some mental struggles, some mental blocks. And she even just last week completely, you know, smacked on a dive, hurt herself really bad, but because she knew how to kind of change what her mind was saying, she was able to get back up and perform the dive again, where usually she would just leave and not, not go back to practice. And here she was able to get up right away, kind of shake it off, um, change her whole attitude and mindset and do the dive again and do it really well. So she was telling me all about it yesterday and how confident she was because she now knows that if that happens, she knows how to get through it and move past it. So it's really cool seeing this wide spectrum of athletes and ages yeah. and where they're at in their careers, but able to use these same tools to advance and move forward and push past like big challenges. Brilliant. And I know that you obviously damaged your foot and just before, you know, the Olympic, uh, the Olympics in 2000, only a few weeks to train, made the team. So did you start with your own mindset techniques or did you have a mentor or did you have someone in your life that helped you through that process to come out far stronger? You know, I mean, I've had some great coaches in my life. I've had one that was my coach for about 30 years. And in college, I had a different coach for about three years who was also an Olympian. And, you know, just them really kind of guiding me and telling me stories of what they'd seen. And, and my experience just watching other athletes. And I had seen, you know, some really phenomenal athletes do some different things. Like um, one of my idols, his name was Dmitry Stoughton. He was a Russian diver. And I remember watching this final. I was there to cheer on my teammate. And as everybody was warming up, I watched him just stand in the shower the entire time with his head down, like it was beating on the back of his neck and he did nothing. And I was like, what is he doing? Like, he's the best one in this field. Like, why is he just standing there? But I could tell he was going through something in his mind. His eyes were closed. He was doing something. And he got up and had the best competition still to this day I maybe have ever seen in my life. He got tens on every single dive that he did in that competition. 
because he was just preparing himself in his mind. And I was like, what did he do? You know, so that kind of started my wheels turning. And that was just a couple of years into my journey and, and hearing other stories of athletes like that. I just started trying stuff on my own and trying to do different things. When I had an injury, I would try to think outside the box and my coaches, you know, would give me ideas of things to try. And I think really the biggest deal was I was the only one willing to do those things, yeah. um, you know, because it wasn't physical training. So people didn't see the value in it. Yeah. And really when push came to shove and I, I had that really dramatic foot injury just three months before our trials, I had no other choice but to operate outside the box because I, I wasn't able to do anything else. And so that really pushed me to a place um, that I never expected to go um, and to a level in my mindset that I never really even thought about or thought was possible. Um, but that was the very thing that didn't just help me make the Olympic team. That's what helped me stand on top of the podium for sure. Without a That doubt. was a gift as hard as it was in, in hindsight, it was a gift to you to, to develop sort of mindset and mental resilience and anti-fragility. That was really the start of you sort of uncovering a lot of this truth. It was, it was the very thing that equipped me for that challenge ahead for sure. And then you've obviously got a course. We'll put a link to the show notes, Confident Competitor. How long have you been running that course for? And sort of give us maybe one or two stories there. <clears throat> well, it's funny because I I actually, after a nine-year retirement, I decided to get back in the water and train again um, yeah. with all my kids in tow. And partway into that journey, I found out that I was going to have to have a two-level cervical fusion. So I have a lovely plate and six screws in my neck still today. Um, and I knew the recovery from that was going to be long. And I didn't even know if I would be able to get back in the water, but I was like, okay, I've done some outside the box stuff. I know that, that it's really about your mind. So I'm going to take this time of recovery and really try to like, think about all the things that I've learned throughout my career and kind of, you know, just, just to help myself. Yeah. But in that process, as I was re remembering all these stories and going through all these things I learned, I was like, I need to teach this to other people. Like I need to put the, I can put this together and I can start telling other athletes because they just don't know, or their coaches just don't know this. And so I kind of put together a course during that recovery time that was confident competitor and started taking athletes through it. But then as I recovered and got back in the water, I kind of put it on the shelf and didn't really okay. think about it until this last year, I finally hung up the suit and I had some athletes calling for some coaching and I was like, okay, I need to bring this back and, and really start walking people through it. And, and it's been really fun. You know, I'm, I'm learning how to be a, a, a business person instead of an athlete. That's a big change for me, but okay. I, I absolutely love the mm -hmm. mental side of things because it's when you start break, like anything, when you break it down, it's not that complicated. It's yeah. very simple, but it's things that people aren't willing to do on a consistent basis to yeah. actually make valid changes in what they're doing. Consistently do those changes. That's the key. Mm -hmm. But maybe it started when you were 15, Laura, because you know you only started diving late. Someone said, listen, you'll never make it. The sport's like long gone. You're a gymnast. And so someone says you can't and you say, I can. And although they said you were taking a bit of a waste of their time, you still managed within a year to become this incredible champion. So was it maybe nurture or nature that helped you when you were 15 to say, listen, I'm going from gymnastics. My daughter's a gymnast. And at 15 to go from gymnastics now to diving is quite a big jump. Mm hmm yeah, I think, you know, I honestly think it started way before that. Um, and I was actually talking to my students about belief last night and what belief actually is. And we don't have belief based on evidence or proof. It is just this choice we make to believe in something. And when I was eight years old, I saw Mary Lou Retton do a perfect 10 vault and win an Olympic gold medal. And I wanted that to be me. And right. I was just dead set in my brain that that would be me. And I was not a very good gymnast. I was an okay gymnast, but <laughs> I knew at 13 years old, I was not going to be a Mary Lou Retton. And so I didn't want to give up my dream. I still had that dream of standing on top of the podium. So I started seeking out other sports and I was really good at a lot of them, but none of them I was passionate about like I was gymnastics until I found diving, which is very much like gymnastics into the water, but you have to learn how to land on your head and not your feet. So a little bit of a change there, but I fell in love with it from day one. And I was like this, I can see yeah. myself going to the top in. And that had always been my motivation and my dream. And I never let that go. So I think when I found this avenue of something I could excel at quickly, um, you know, and I was thrown into a group of ex gymnasts. We'd all kind of started at the same time. We were very competitive in like a healthy way, pushing each other and learning together. We all excelled really quickly. And so, you know, I think my timing was really fortunate to be with those other, uh, ladies, but, um, yeah, it was just, it was just something in me that I was always like, this is what I'm going to do. And it, it sounded stupid. I didn't like to tell people what my dream was, but I was just bound and determined that that was going to be my future.
Sounds amazing. Sounds like there was an, a moment, either your nature or your nurture or combination that you said, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to reach for that dream. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Now I've got a six-year-old daughter, Laura, and, and she's like a proud i'm a proud dad and i think she's brilliant i think she started gymnastics she's got a real knack for it and she's you know at the same level as two three years girls older than her and i want to now work on mindset because i know that's probably the most important take us through a basic frame i'm going to put links to confident competitor i think that's important you can't you know take this long course and sort of dramatically reduce it but take us through the steps take us through process I've got almost a clean slate here, although she does already have a bit of performance anxiety because she's got a bit of perfectionism. If she can't get it perfect and get it 100%, she doesn't want to do it. But take us through a structured process for the listeners as well on where you start with mindset. Um, well, the very first thing we walk through is goal setting, which is just kind of where it all should begin. We need that foundation right on how to set goals and how to create SMART goals. I mean, I kind of like the acronym SMART. I kind of mm. changed some of the meanings because I hate the words like uh, realistic because I yeah. think that's shouldn't be anywhere around goals. Goals are not something you should currently yeah. be able to do. They're supposed to be out of your reach so that you Unrealistic. have to go and change to get them. Exactly. <laughs> they should be something you can't do. Yeah. You have to figure out how to get there. So it's creating a goal that's specific um, and it's something you're reaching toward, but then also if you have this big goal that you can't currently do, how are you supposed to get there? So yeah. I really walk them through creating a plan of action to reach that goal. And there's something that happens in your mind as you not just write down this goal that you have, like you can have a goal in your head, but when you start writing it down and you start telling people what it is, it becomes more real to you, more tangible, something you're committing to. But then also you start writing out this plan of action to get there suddenly you realize that it's actually possible. Like, okay, well, if I do these things, I can actually work my way to that level. And that it's something that just those little tiny, you know, things that you're changing in your brain that starts to process it different and it becomes this real thing. So we make that foundation first and we talk about motivation, how, um, you know, you have to have motivation because even the most motivated person in the world is going to have a bad day. They're going to have a day of doubt. They're going to have, you know, days where they don't want to get out of bed in the morning. But if you want something because of some reason you have that why, that's what gets you out of bed. That's what makes you push through when it's hard or uncomfortable. So kind of making that our firm foundation. And then we walk through things like how to move past failure. Um, you know, you have to grieve it. You have to be able to walk past it and know that the next event is not a do over, you know, it's a clean slate. It's, it's not, it's not the same event. Again, this is a brand new opportunity. You're walking in with a different perspective of it. We talk about preparation, creating routines around training and competition, um, you know, and, and how the, the, it's the preparation that leads to that state of flow or that athlete zone. You know, there's, there's certain things we kind of walk through like the 10 things that make up the athlete zone, but how getting into the zone isn't just something that magically happens. Like you have to prepare for that so you can allow your body and your mind to get into that state. And um, we walk through fear, how to manage fear, how to manage that voice inside your head, how to deal with emotions, um, not by controlling them, but learning how to guide them and use them because they're I like powerful. That. I like that. So my daughter's yeah. got fear now when she does, you know, gymnastics and she's got the next thing to do. How do you deal with that fear? Because you never want to deny the fear. And you got to accept it, but then you got to live in the same space. So give me a little bit of a quick coaching lesson on how a six-year-old deals with fear as she's just about to do this gymnastic move. Mm -hmm. And I love it because I made a five-day fear challenge because fear is really common in my sport too. And that's just something, especially with the pandemic, fear became a very big thing for everyone. Mm -hmm. So um, fear is really like learning what fear is, that it's not a tangible thing. It's a feeling, it's an emotion you have in your mind and it's, it's based, I mean, it's, it's your, your mind protecting yourself, trying to protect you from something, but it's not real. It's just a feeling and it can feel real and it can feel powerful and it can make you feel powerful emotions. But when you know that it's just a feeling and you can start calling out and naming what it is that you're scared of and looking at that and okay, how do I rewire my brain around that? Like if I am scared of hitting the platform, Okay, well, how do I need to address that? So I'm I'm not just, I can call it out. I know I'm just scared of this. It's not an actual thing that is happening to me currently. I'm scared it will happen. So how do I how do I kind of change my mind around that? Well, you either need to say something positive, like, I know if I do this certain action, I won't hit the platform. You know, you're you're rewiring it in a positive way in your brain because we can't process the negative things. We don't really understand that. It just gravitates us toward that negative thing. So when you're thinking about it in a positive way, like if I, you know, 
keep my head tall, then I won't, I won't be anywhere near the platform. I will be safe. Or my coach is going to teach me the right techniques or ask a question. How can I do X so that I'm a safe distance from the platform? So it's, it's just rephrasing it a little bit in your mind instead of I'm scared I'm going to hit the platform. Don't hit the platform. Cause you say, don't hit the platform. Yeah. All you're thinking about is hitting the platform. Yeah. But if you can change that to do a certain technique, or you're asking a question of how I move past this, you start reacting to it. You think about it differently, which means you respond and react to it differently. And it, it allows you to calm down a little bit. So it's a lot of that, that voice inside our head and learning how to recognize what it's saying and then how to appropriately change it so that you can move forward. Okay. So, so a lot yeah. of self-talk, making sure self that you actually, you've, you've almost like rehearsed it. It's a mm -hmm. thing that you respond to with regards to those fears so that as soon as that fear thought comes, you've got a response. Okay, platform. Okay, I'm not going to twist or turn. I'm not going to make it. I'm going to get my back. So you need a response towards all those fears. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. For sure. And I, and I think uh, like, and writing them down is just a great exercise because then you start to realize like you can write down your fears and then you can even put like, I feel in front of it. So it's not just this fear. It's I feel this. It's not just this thing. It's I'm feeling this way because you're calling it out what it is. It's a feeling. And then you're responding to it. And so you, you start by writing that down and understanding where your brain's going and how you want to redirect it. And as you get more consistent and better at that, you'll start recognizing these things popping up in your head on the spot and you'll be able to change them more on the spot. Like it just gets easier and easier that way. And then soon mm -hmm. enough, you're, you're automatically not going to the negative thoughts. You're starting to automatically go to more positive, more concrete, you know, like how do I get past this kind of, mm -hmm. kind of thoughts? So it's really just, you're, you're changing the way your, your brain is functioning. And it, mm -hmm. it sounds so weird. It sounds so simple in some ways, but like, it's completely possible to change who you are and uh, in, in good ways, you know? And I, yeah. and I, I don't like it when people get stuck on like personality traits or Enneagrams or, you know, their signs. Like I, I think those are fun and you can learn a little bit about yourself, but when you use that as your excuse, that's no good. Like you can yeah. change how you respond. You can change how you think, but you have to put in the effort to do that. So I, I don't like it when people make those kinds of, to me, those are like excuses of not taking yeah. action. Now we've always got a shadow. We've got a strength and a shadow. We've got to work with those shadows, but the basis of a lot of those shadows is fear-based. It's one of the mm -hmm. biggest reasons we all have to deal with it. And then we, you know, bypass this frontal cortex and we go to the amygdala and we lose all logic and reason instead of being prepared with what you're saying. Oh, I've thought that before. I know what I'm going to say. Oh, I've had that thought. I know what I'm going to say to that. Otherwise, you're in the state of emotion and amygdala and then you kick in and you lose all grasp of reality because you haven't prepared Brilliant. I, I really like that. Let's talk about when the person, because fear is such a big thing with regards to performance. What other techniques do you do? You teach breath work. Do you teach mindfulness techniques? Do you? How do you? Other techniques you you give your clients or your coaches to deal with fear. So yeah, one of the things we do after we talk about fear and that inner voice and emotions and all those things, we do start talking about mindfulness and just learning what that is. It's just being present. It's learning how to be present and. I don't really think you need to do anything crazy. I think just learning how to sit still for a few minutes, learning how to, to feel the world around you, to, to, to recognize your breath, to draw yourself in, to learn how to be present. I honestly didn't learn that through breath work. I learned it through my quiet time with the Lord. Like, so I've, I've always, I've been a believer for a long time. And so my quiet time and my prayer time actually really taught me how to listen and to be still and to be present. And I think that's how I naturally learned it. Um, now I understand, you know, a little bit of how you can bring yourself into that state. But when you, when you practice that, you know, like anything else, people just want to show up to a meet and like learn how to do that, like automatically think they know how to do it. But like this stuff takes practice because sometimes we can't sit still and not let our mind go in 80 different directions. Exactly. For two minutes. You know, you have to practice that it's hard. Mm -hmm. And once we kind of learn how to be still and be present, the next thing we talk about is visualization. And now that you've got this presence and this awareness, you can now start like imagining your technique and what you're doing, you know, in your sport and how that works um, and imagining both your training and competitions and different scenarios and learning how to bring in all of your senses to what you're doing um, really. And then just talking about that, that unwavering belief and, and, and knowing that you are capable, no matter what other people say, um, no matter what other people think, like you are capable. And it's just based on a belief that you have. There doesn't have to be evidence or proof. If you start believing in what you're doing, the way you act around it is going to change and will probably in turn 
make you able to do it. You know, oh, if you fantastic. think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you're right. <laughs> your belief becomes I am statements. Then that becomes your identity. But it only comes through repetition of belief. And even that process you want, you went through, it has to be automated at the subconscious level. It can't be conscious. It's taking so much energy while you're sitting on top, climbing up the ladder and then going onto the platform and you've got to consciously do it. It's got to be automated to take the least amount of energy from you in that correct moment. Which means you need to practice it. Yeah, 100%. Brilliant. Right. It reminds me of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's work on flow Stephen Kotler's work on Art of the Impossible, this flow state. I watched some of your videos. You look like you're in the zone. Some people call it in the zone. Some people call it flow. He's got this whole incredible book. I'm trying to reach out to him because I just think so many people need to deal with performance anxiety and deal with you know a lot of fear when they're actually either public speaking or they're an athlete or they're competing, whatever it is. But the Art of the Impossible and flow states, how would you train your coaches or people that are in your sort of network with regards to getting into that zone that you were so, I don't know, it just looked like you were just in there every time I watched a video. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, I've, I've definitely had times where I'm not in the zone too, <laughs> for sure. Um, but again, it's, it's the preparation that you put into it. It's trying these things in practice and learning who you are in a practice before you ever get to the competition. It's going to smaller competitions and trying different things, trying to put your mind in a certain place, working on that visualization and, and trying and failing and figuring out like that way does not work for me. This way was okay. Like let's take this and, and work on it some more. Um, it's, it's a lot of trial and error and people don't want to hear that we're, we're in this world of instant gratification. They just want some trick that'll work right away. And, and that anything worth, anything worth fighting after and, and worth mm. pursuing is not going to happen in an instant. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. And it's really hard. I think for people to grasp the mental side, because it's not as tangible. Cause like you feel like when you're doing something physical, you're working really hard, you're getting your body in shape. You can see the changes you're making physically. It's a lot harder to see the changes you're making mentally until it's been an extended period of time. And you recognize how you are operating differently or how you reacted differently to something. And it's, it's hard too, because it takes a certain level of humility because you have to become very self-aware and you have to look at yourself, not, not in a perfectionist kind of state. You have to be willing to like, let go of the perfection and say, I want, I want my change more than I want to be perfect. I want to get better at this. So it's, you know, turning from that fixed mindset into that growth mindset a little bit. Um, and it's really funny because I learned all these things and I had no vocabulary for it until I've gotten older. And I've learned that, Hey, there's words like flow and there's words like growth mindset and mindfulness. But like, I learned what all these things were on my own kind of accidentally. Um, so it's, it's kind of nice to be able to put some words to it these days, but, yeah. but yeah, like anything, it takes, it takes practice and preparation. Okay. So in terms of flow, do you think there are certain things that you use music? Did you have like prayer times or what are the hacks that got you into flow? You know, you've mentioned visualization, you've mentioned a bit of mindfulness and there, what are other sort of tips or hacks you can give to the audience or the, or the listeners with regards to, you know, getting into that flow state? So I think this is kind of really important when you're thinking about like routines and you're creating like a, an in competition routine, like what you want to do in the competition. Um, yeah. Like a lot of athletes, I like to use music because if I'm feeling low on my energy, I can pump myself up. Or if I'm too like wound up, I can calm myself down, you know, with, with what I'm listening to. Um, I put very specific things on my playlist and, and stuff like that. But there's a difference between a routine and a ritual that I think is really, really important for people to recognize. Cause when you create a routine. If something happens within that routine, you can be flexible. You can adjust to it. It's not a big deal. You just have a loose structure of how you want it to go, but it's not in concrete, you know, where people get these rituals where they have to do the exact same thing, the exact same way, or it doesn't work out right. You know, and really what happens there is you're wiring your brain that if you don't do this, this ritual exactly right, you have already taken yourself out mentally. And I did that as a gymnast. I learned at like 12 years old, I took myself out because I put my rubber band in my hair the wrong way. And I had a bad gymnastics meet and I put my hair the right way the next day and it was much better. Had nothing to do with a rubber band. A rubber band does not have anything to do with the way I do gymnastics. And it frustrated me to the point of where I started doing my hair all different ways so that I couldn't be bound to that ritual, that I had to learn that I was a good enough gymnast without how I was doing my hair. I knew logically 
it played no no role in that. But for some reason, mentally, I was thinking it did. And so I kind of forced myself out of that. And that's something I still fall back into sometimes. And I have to like go out of my way to, to show myself sometimes that it's not about this ritual I'm doing. It's who I am. It's what I've been doing. It's how I've been training. And so I think having a routine, like I love listening to music, but in the middle of my Sydney Olympic finals, um, my battery, this was back before we could charge in our, our iPhones to the wall. This was with a Discman that required two AA batteries. Yeah. My batteries died in the middle of that final and I didn't have music. Wow. So I had to be able to roll with the punches. And I think the only reason that I held it together was because I was so mentally prepared for any kind of crazy thing. I never imagined my batteries dying on my on my discman in the middle of the finals, but I had imagined weird things happening, you know, the meet getting halted for technical reasons, somebody doing something weird, you know, coming out of the stands. Like I'd imagined weird things. So when that happened, you know, I did have a moment of panic, but I was able to calm myself down yeah. and realize that I knew what I was doing in this dive. I almost gave myself this like really incredible pep talk. So I was more confident going into that dive than it probably would have been if I'd just been listening to my music. Yeah. So wow. having a routine, but making it so it's not this ritual that you can mess up and then that takes your brain out of the competition. Just a good structure that can be flexible is really important. It reminds me of the story of Michael Phelps and I think his coach, you know, he had his can sometimes swim with his goggles, like with water in his goggles. And he used to train that way. And then even when it did happen in one meet, he still won the meet because he had already done it. He had been there. He knew what to do. He had to count his strokes. He knew that exactly. Got him to a rhythm and he won it. It seems like you were sort of a bit of ahead of the crowd. Was it a coach that influenced you to make sure that if something went wrong, boom, you got back into the zone quickly? Or was it just something you said, hang on, I better do this. Otherwise, I'm not going to succeed. I think that was just because I had so many hours up on the 10 meter, like going through the actions of my dives when I couldn't actually be in the water training that after I like knew how to do my dives, like I would in training, I would go through meet scenarios. Like I would put myself in a competition and I know who my competitors were, what dives they did, what order they did them. And I would just create these imaginary competitions in my brain, probably because I was just so bored of <laughs> being up there that I just kind of like thought about all these different situations. And by doing that day after day, week over week for like 10 weeks, you know, I'm doing that for like six hours a day. Like I spent a lot of time in my head imagining all kinds of scenarios. So I was just ready for anything at that point. Okay, brilliant. Let's talk about a bit of recovery. What are your favorite tools? I know we we both love Katsu. I'm a huge fan of Katsu, blood flow modification. Used mm -hmm. it with myself, a lot of my community. Uh, clients have really raved about it with regards to recovery. Tell us about Laura Wilkinson's, you know, recovery tools with her coaches. Well, yeah, I love Katsu and I wish I had found it earlier. I only found it kind of at the very end of this twilight career that I had, um, but it helped a lot with, I have nerve damage in my arm from my neck injury and yeah. I mean, 15 minutes of Katsu and my arm would stop cramping. Like it was amazing. So um, that was a tool I wish I'd had a long time before because it, it both helped me flush out, but then I also used it during training. Um, so it's, that's such a brilliant tool. Um, I used to do ice baths, like back in the two thousands, like leading up to 2008, I would do a lot of ice baths, um, after really hard, like platform trainings. And that, that was really amazing. I love rollers, like the hard rollers. Um, those are my favorite and, and really just a lacrosse ball working out all the stuff behind my shoulder blades and stuff. That is my favorite tool for all my neck and arm stuff that I have. Mm. That's, I take my lacrosse ball everywhere, even still today. Mm. <laughs> Any infrared sauna, we've got a product called flex beam. It's a portable red light and infrared light. It's incredible with the athletes that we use here and across the globe. Have you used light therapy for recovery or performance? I did a little bit my last my last year or so diving I started doing um some cryotherapy and I would do the light bed like right after that and I really yeah you, f you felt so refreshed after that mm. like you just felt different you felt really good so I I do I do love that combination Okay what about peptides or sort of any uh performance enhancing nootropics you know I had Mr Nudes from Nootopia on the sh show it would be a good one to have on your show, Pursuit of Gold is your podcast. Incredible guys put a lot of, you know, these uh, formulations together. What are your athletes saying with regards to any sort of, uh, you know, legal performing, enhancing supplements or peptides? It's quite, I do a lot of injections of peptides for my athletes, for myself and many people for recovery, BPC-157 and so What is your knowledge in that area? 
Very limited. Um, I was always really scared as an athlete to take anything outside the box because I saw people get flagged for their regular multivitamins just because it had been mixed in a batch with stuff. So I was really scared to do any kind of supplements um, during my career. I just, I wanted to make sure I was clean. And so that was just something I kind of stayed away with just because of the drug testing, which it could be totally fine. I mean, there's research on there. You can learn what you can and can't do, but I was just really (laughs) paranoid about that stuff. Any of your athletes now that have had incredible sort of results with anything specific, people that you're coaching? I, I haven't really, I haven't really talked about it that much with people. So yeah, okay. that's, not, that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. Yeah. Sure. Hyperbaric oxygen, HBOT, any of that that you've used to heal injuries with your athletes or yourself getting to the oxygen t- chambers or ozone or anything like that, that you've got experience with? I don't, I don't have experience with that. No, no, no problem at all. All right, let's move on to something that I've wanted to discuss with you with regards to performance athletes is as you get older, you know, it seems like we believe that performance drops, but in many ways, even someone like Stephen Kotler has written, written this book called Nar Country, is that how do you train the older athletes? Is it very different to the younger athletes? We've got an, also an older audience that are trying to improve their performance, whether it's at the office, whether it's in the bedroom, <laughs> whether it's on the sports field. Is how do, you, how do you work with older athletes? Is there any major differences that you want to comment on? Yeah, I think that sometimes you... Like, and what I found too is coming back in my forties, um, I competed at the last Olympic trials at 43 with my four kids in the stands. So I understand a little bit about being an older athlete and I, I could still put in the same amount of time, but I wouldn't recover. So I had to do about half the amount of time that I used to train, which is still a lot of, I mean, it was still five hours of training a day, but you know, um, that felt limited to me. It was like one long workout a day instead of two, or, you know, even doing weights after that, it was just too much for me to recover. So I had to limit my time and make sure my quality was higher, you know, and make sure that I was giving myself enough time to recover, um, for sleeping, but then also to recover from like platform, which is really hard on our body. Cause we hit the water at 30 miles an hour. So, you know, recovery became a lot more important for me. Um, but I also have learned that when I had like, since I I hung up the suit last year and I've been out of the pool and my workouts not been as consistent and I feel awful. Like when I was in there training every day and doing these really hard things, I had a lot more energy. I felt a lot more active and I loved it. And so, and I'm noticing that just all of a sudden I feel my age sometimes I'm like, well, this is dumb. You know, I didn't feel my age last year. That's the only thing that's different. So I'm like getting back into my workouts and learning how to incorporate that when it's not my main job and what I'm doing. So, um, definitely the more active that you are, the better you're going to feel. Um, but make sure you're not overdoing it because that recovery time is really important as you get older. So really going for quality over quantity. And did you do aerobic exercise and anaerobic and high intensity interval trainings? How did your training look as you got older? Did you find that you had to be careful with regards to how many weight sessions you did strength training? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, what I found, and this was really interesting too, um, is that I got back in and I started doing weights with our group and I, I started lifting really heavy, which is great. I mean, I could deadlift like 335 and I was squatting like 285. Like I could do some really good, I was doing what all the kids were doing what the 25 year olds and the teenagers were doing, which was awesome, but it wasn't helping my platform. I actually felt like even though I was stronger, I was spinning slower and I didn't feel as good. So when I actually like lowered what I was doing in weights and started doing more plyometric work, my vertical increased by like four inches within six weeks. And so for me, I realized because I like people who go on the springboard and they have to like put all their weight and ride the board down slow, like you need to be doing those weight room workouts. But for someone like me, who's on that static platform that doesn't give, you need to be able to pop and have that quick power coming off of it. So I the only kind of aerobic I would really do, it's more like hit, like I would do more sprinting type things like that. A lot of just different jumping exercises, both for height and for distance, um, you know, all kinds of little things like that. Um, and I would do it with Katsu on too. And then I wasn't even sore afterward. It was kind of amazing. So mm. for me, plyometrics was a big benefit um, in increasing my vertical at 43 years old. I actually increased my vertical by several inches that year. So, you know, mm. and I, I kind of wish I had kept doing that just to see how far I could go, but uh, that was pretty cool. And do you think that was a combination because we were a huge believer in Katsu, Katsu and the plyometrics together as you're training in training mode? Do you think that was the key that you could do less, you know, amount of time and volume, but really quality with the Katsu, really put those muscles under significant strain and tension 
and that made a big difference. Is that how you use Kartu? Yeah, because when I first started doing the plyometrics, um, I was definitely like getting that higher vertical, but I would be really sore the next day and it would affect workouts a little bit the next day. But once I started doing my plyometrics with Katsu on in the training mode, and then I would recover with it after, um, I wasn't sore the next day. I felt great the next day. Um, so I, that was my recovery was was a lot faster with Katsu. For and then sure. you put it on cycle mode. For how long? Five, six cycles? How, how did you use the cycle mode? Well, usually I would do, so I would be in training mode for about 15 minutes um, of like the hardcore training mode. And then I would cycle, like do three different cycles. So maybe 15 minutes. Um, if I was really sore, or really exhausted, maybe I'd do one or two more. But it took me a while to get used to Katsu because I'm not an aerobic athlete. I'm an anaerobic athlete. I'm just that quick twitch. So when I, the first two weeks I did Katsu, I was exhausted because I didn't realize it's pumping all that blood. And I felt like I was doing all these aerobic workouts that I wasn't used to. So it took me a few weeks to kind of realize what I needed and when, when I could push it and do more, you know, timer, if I just needed to keep it on low for five sessions instead of working my way up. So a lot of times my flushing out would just be on like lower medium. Okay, good. Uh, just as we come to the end of the show, in terms of performance, uh, what do you look at? I mean, you've got four children from what I understand. Is, do you work on identity in terms of really performing at a high level consistently? Obviously, we've spoken about mindset, but what other factors or variables do, would you want to ensure, you know, people that you coach or your own children with regards to performance? Um, well, that it's really like you need to set those goals and you need to have those big, un, you know, unattainable goals at the moment that you're trying to strive to, but know that you're not always going to achieve them. And that's OK, um, because I went to three Olympic Games and I only won one medal, but it didn't make those other two Olympic Games not worth trying for, not worth working toward. And my goal, don't get me wrong, my goal was to win every single one of those. Um, but different things happen, you know, in each of those scenarios. Um, but I still won another world cup title and a world championship title in there. Um, you know, I became very decorated. I learned dives. I never expected to do, um, eight years after I won a gold medal, I was doing things that were harder than some of the men were doing. And I, I never even thought that was possible until that point. So just because I didn't reach my big end goal doesn't mean I didn't shatter my own expectations. Um, cause I just made such huge goals for myself, you know, and I, I did reach at our Olympic trials that year, a score that would have vied for the gold medal in Beijing in 2008. So I was at that level and I had pushed myself, you know, as far as I could go, I think. And, and that to me, I can look back and be very proud on, even though it didn't end with the medal again, like I wanted. Um, so that's, you're going to have these big goals. You're not always going to reach them, but you're going to be so much farther than if you hadn't made those goals for yourself. And you can look back and be proud and be confident mm. in what you've accomplished. And it's going to change who you are because you don't get to the top of the podium and then you're this great champion. Like you have to become the champion on the way to end up on the top of the podium. There's a lot of champions out there that don't ever make it to the top of the podium. You know, I can't tell you how many times I came in fourth place at a world meet a whole bunch. Like I was fourth and fifth place, sixth place at a whole bunch of world meets. Not, I didn't work any less hard at those meets. It just wasn't my moment or my time or something happened. But, you know, I kept pushing and I kept striving um, and did great things. And I feel like I've become a champion outside of my sport as well because of the way I pushed myself. So have those goals, shoot after them, but know that you are growing into this better person because of it. So it's not just about that end goal. Cool. That was really, really well said. Uh, tell us possibly one theme why you didn't succeed in some of those meets. Was there a common thread? There was just a weakness or something that you thought or something that happened common, commonly in those meets? Um, like when I was fourth? Yeah, when you were fourth or fifth or sixth and it just didn't go exactly. You might not have been in flow and there was a common thread or some common thought, something that you struggled with in your career. Obviously, very decorative. I mean, it's just like, well, put links to the website and there's just a gain achievement upon achievement. But what are some of the things that probably were your, you know, hamstrung your career? You know, I, I wouldn't say there was one thing because it was different almost every time, um, which is why I kept learning, I think, and kept striving for that. Um, but I, I really, I think, and I think this is something that I've really learned and I really try to teach my students about failure is that, you know, <laughs> you can just sit there and feel sorry for yourself or you can learn from it and get better. You know, it doesn't have to be the end. Like failure is not fatal. It can actually be the beginning of something great. And so every time I got fourth or fifth or sixth, like 
what I would analyze, like what went wrong. Once I grieved, you got to make sure you grieve the process too. Like if you don't hit that dream or that goal, it's okay to like cry a little bit. It's okay to get that out. If you don't, you're going to hang on to it. It's going to turn into bitterness. Like let the emotions out. Then once you do, you can look a little more logically at what happened, what were my mistakes, what kept me off that podium or what kept me from reaching my goal. And for me, sometimes it was like, I just learned new dives and I didn't have enough experience with them yet. And so they just weren't real consistent. One time I had an injury, you know, another time I realized that at the 2004 Olympics and this still like aggravates me today because I did something I never do. I knew I was in a decent contention and I played a dive safe. I didn't go after it all the way. And that cost me a podium. Like it cost me being on the medal stand. I was, I was off by like 11 points and that would have made all the difference. And so like that still gets to me. So from that point on, I never played it safe again. I was like, I'd rather go all out and like land on my face, but at least know I put it all out there yeah. than to just not go after it. So every time I was learning something new, every time I was trying to push it, you know, even further and, and learn and build off of what that mistake was. So I don't think it was a consistent mistake. It was, it was just always evolving and me trying to be more. Brilliant. The future mm -hmm. for Laura Wilkinson. I mean, I know you're a speaker, you got this podcast, the pursuit of gold. We'll put the links in the show notes. You had some incredible, you had a psychiatrist on that I was listening to. So you got some incredible people on your show and uh, hopefully we can uh, connect possibly after the show and I can have them on my show. Cause I think, there's a lot a lot of work needs to be on the mental state on mindset of people belief and then i think that's probably the area uh, lacking most i think training techniques and physical and strength and what we've learned and human biology and neurobiology is right up there but i think the mental state is is lacking but what about the future for laura wilkinson what are you going to be doing and how are you going to be empowering others well, I've kind of just really started coaching these other athletes on mindset and performance um, in the last six months. So it's still kind of new for me. And it's really the first thing I've been passionate about since diving. So I'm I'm really excited to kind of help these athletes take their performance to the next level. And um, I love as I was going through my course uh, with this last group of athletes, when they'd show up, you know, that week and like, tell me what great things they did or how they overcame something yeah. like it's, it almost feels like I've done it. Like, I feel like a proud parent to my students, you know, it's, it's really cool. So I hope to continue doing that. Um, I love hosting the podcast. It's amazing talking to, to just cool people like yourself about all these mental things, um, and just amazing athlete stories. So probably something within that realm, but, uh, yeah, I can't get rid of me though. I'm, I'm always going to be around. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I want to declare favor and blessing over you, Laura Wilkinson. Thank you for your time, your calling, your courage. And you've got a very strong faith. And maybe you can end with this, how important your spiritual health is and just where you are spiritually. I think that's important. A message of hope. Uh, it's been a really tough two, three years. You know, I've been in practice as a physician for 24 years. I've never seen so many people with burnout, with fatigue has become my number one complaint and just emotional like reserve is at its lowest. So possibly a message of hope uh, with regards to spiritual health and where you are spiritually and how important that is with the athlete. Mm hmm um, yeah, for sure. And I think, I think having a solid foundation and Jesus is totally my foundation. Um, mm. you know, I am a Christian and so turning to the Bible, knowing that I can find answers, um, that I have access to prayer, um, speaking with him, listening, not just speaking, but also listening, um, mm. and trusting the plan, you know, like I know he gives me goals and dreams. Um, but sometimes it's not necessarily to achieve those, but to lead me in a certain direction where he's going to do something even more incredible watching him work through, um, my kids. Like I, I have two biological kids, but we've also adopted two and those were crazy hard journeys. Um, and he has knit our family together in a beautiful way. But I think when you don't have a firm foundation to turn to, it makes life really hard because you're just you know, you're kind of rolling with the wind and, and whichever way it blows you. And that can be really hard and confusing and devastating at times. But when you always have this firm foundation, a solid rock to go back to, it keeps you grounded. And you realize that you have purpose, that you were created on purpose for a purpose, that you're not just, you know, some exposable thing here on the planet. Like you, you were made for a reason and you were called good and wonderful. And that's something that you can hang on to. And I think we all need to know that and hear that. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. And are one of your kids interested in diving? How old are your kids? Are they going to become performance athletes? 
Um, we will see my, I have an, a two 11 year old, a nine year old and a seven year old. And my oldest did die for about two years, um, but decided that was not her sport and has finally found her way to volleyball, which she okay. absolutely loves. It lights her up like nothing else. Um, she's a setter and she, yeah, it's just nuts about that right now. So she's probably our biggest athlete in the group. Um, I have an artist, I have a kid that loves robotics and a little one that just wants to do what everybody else is doing. So okay. um, they're going to find their own path and I'm going to cheer them on every step of the way. Brilliant. Well, once again, I'm trying to close this podcast out, but favor and blessing upon you, Laura Wilkinson. And I just see you going from strength to strength and thriving more and more. So from Steve Stans and the Mates, it's our show. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm.